Hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorky and today I'm very, very honored and excited to be interviewing a very special space champion, Dr. Erin McDonald. Dr. McDonald is the science advisor for the entire Star Trek fan franchise and works as a writer and producer in Los Angeles, California. She truly has the dream job. She is an internationally sought, sought after public speaker, educator, STEAM advocate, writer, and technical consultant who explains complex physics and astronomy ideas to varied audiences. She holds an undergraduate degree from the University of Colorado Boulder, where she dual majored in physics with astrophysics and mathematics. She earned her PhD at 25 in gravitational astrophysics and her postdoctoral research with the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory Scientific Collaboration on Gravitational Waves from Dead and Colliding Stars and Black Holes contributed to the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics. Absolutely incredible. These are simply some of her many wonderful accomplishments in the aerospace industry. I'm incredibly excited to hear about Dr. McDonald's journey and what got her really intrigued with space and more importantly, how she got into working with Star Trek. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking your time to inspire the next generation. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, before we get into like understanding, like I was mentioning a little bit more about what excites you in space more specifically, could you first start off and talk a little bit about how your typical day usually runs? I know there usually isn't a typical day, but how does your day usually run? Yeah, so, you know, my days are typically a mix of the science advising for Star Trek and a little bit of science communication. And so I will um, typically have scripts to read. I will have notes to send on those scripts. I might have a couple meetings that I have to take either with a post-production team or with the writing team um, and then doing events like this. So doing podcasts, doing interviews and uh, trying to interact with the public and engage on space science. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I have to ask, what is your, I know, I know I'm sure you have many memorable experiences from Star Trek and working with Star Trek. And I was, I met you at ISTC where you gave a presentation on Star Trek and, you know, some of the things that was science fiction, but some of the things that was real science that you incorporated. And so I'm curious to hear, what is your most favorite experience from working with a show? Um, That's a great question. I think the most memorable thing for me was learning that Kate Mulgrew would be coming back for Star Trek Prodigy. I had to sit on that secret for a long time, but Captain Janeway is my favorite character. I dedicated my PhD thesis to Captain Catherine Janeway. And so when I found out that um, not only was Kate Mulgrew coming back as Captain Janeway, but now I was going to be able to help you know, write lines or at least put some words here and there in her mouth. And then, and then of course, following that whole thread and getting to actually see that realized was, is pretty phenomenal. That's, that was very emotional for me. Yeah, especially because she was your role model and someone who you really look up to throughout your educational studies. I'm sure it must have been a very incredible experience. And throughout your responses, I can really see how much, you know, STEM communication and science and space communication is very important to you and something that you value. And, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, why do you think it's so important that we equip and prepare and inspire the next generation to really get involved in STEM and in specifically aerospace? Yeah, you know, I think it's so hard. I, I meet so many people who just say like, oh, astrophysics, that sounds so cool. That's, I really wanted to do that, but like, it was really hard or I had a really bad experience and, or I got interested in something else, which is fine. But I think the important thing is like, if that spark is there to try to find every way possible to keep that spark alive. And for me, like that was science fiction. That was sort of finding the X-Files and then contact and all this stuff in the nineties that made science and made being a scientist look cool for me. And that kind of kept me going. And, you know, I think it's just, it's so easy to um, fall out of an interest in science. And yeah. especially, I think the primary thing that makes people lose interest is because they don't see themselves in that field. They don't have a mentor that looks like them or comes from their background that they can be like, oh, no, I can do that. They, if they did it, that, then I can do it. And so that's so important to me, whether it's through fiction or through reality, to have people uh, represented to help keep that next generation's interest. 
Yeah. And one of the things I love about Star Trek is that diversity and is that representation. So many people um, from, you know, decades ago to now always just pride on the fact that, you know, Star Trek has inspired them. And also the representation in the show is something that is incredible. And I'm so glad that the, you know, the franchise and also the work that you're doing constantly revolves around showing that representation. I think that's so important. For sure. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. And kind of getting a little bit a little bit deeper into the science, I personally, um, you know, like you were saying, many are intrigued by astrophysics, but sometimes that confidence level of, am I good enough? To, am I like Einstein to be in physics kind of stops us. But I'm curious to kind of learn a little bit more in very simple terms, if that's possible, about what specifically your PhD research was on um, and what the gravitational, what your research on gravitational waves was. Yeah, I so I started out as an undergraduate doing research in radio astronomy. And then when I was looking for PhD programs, I found the um, University of Glasgow, <coughs> excuse me, was involved in gravitational waves from neutron stars. Now neutron stars give off radio waves, so I had that connection there. But a lot of it was trying to find continuous gravitational waves. So like if a neutron star, which is a dead star, is rotating, It'll, it could be giving off gravitational waves if it's not perfectly round. And so part of that was trying to discover those. Yeah, and you know, what was, what was like, the, I think uh, as a scientist or researcher, something that was, you know, a challenge or an obstacle in the research process that you had to like overcome or, and, you know, I know PhD takes a lot of time and work and effort. So maybe like, could you talk a little bit more about what it was like, the process of getting your PhD? Yeah, sorry, I just got a cough right there. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think the, I mean, PhDs are hard, right? Very few people have them <clears throat> for a good reason. And um, it's really, really tough. And I think for me, the hardest, I'm not crying. I have a cough. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, no like worries at all. super emotional bringing up my PhD. Um, <laughs> but you should but, be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No, I think, I think the biggest struggle for me was just like finding that motivation and trying to like stay inspired because it is so difficult. And I really didn't have a mentor. And I think that that's like what the hardest thing was. And so seriously, I mean, that, that is why I dedicated my thesis to Captain Janeway was because anytime I wanted to quit, I would, um, I would watch Voyager and I would feel inspired. And, <clears throat> you know, weirdly, one of the difficulties that I had was um, I really clashed, I think, with a lot of the older women in my field that um, felt like it wasn't, it was too easy for me. Like I wasn't dealing with as many struggles as they were. And so they felt the need to kind of make my life a little bit harder. It was like a weird dichotomy that I didn't expect. And so when we talk about challenges, like that was probably one of the most surprising and like hurtful things that it took a while to get through and overcome. Yeah, but I I'm always, it was okay. <laughs> yeah, she was there to save the day. And, you know, I'm, I'm, well, thank you for sharing that. I mean, as someone who is still, you know, not that far into their education yet, to hear those experiences, I think, can help us feel prepared. I'm sure times have drastically changed, even just the past five years. But just to hear those experiences are so valuable because if someone else is going through the same situation, they know they can come out and there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, and for I, sure. Yeah, and I read how you founded your own production company, Space Time Productions. I, I don't know how you managed to do everything, but could you share a little <laughs> bit more about what this endeavor is and maybe what was the inspiration behind you founding it? Yeah, I um yeah, thank you for asking me about that. I mean, clearly I I do what I can, but I get sick <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> um but yeah, I uh, the whole sort of space time productions came about because I was doing a lot of freelance work as um, both a writer and as a science consultant. Yeah. And so as part of just kind of continuing to grow that and take a little bit more responsibility professionally and trying to decide where I wanted to go with that, um, starting my own company, even if it's just one person, was kind of the next step. And, and a lot of that too is that you know, one of my best friends whom I met through Star Trek is uh, Mary Chifo, who played um, Laurel in seasons one and two of Discovery, the Klingon Chancellor. Um, but her and I, you know, we met doing conventions, but we've stayed really, really close friends. I mean, best friends after that. But one of the things that we talked about at the end of last year was um, taking a little bit more agency over our careers in the entertainment space. 
And, you know, there were things that we wanted to do, things that we wanted to try out. And one of those was actually producing. Um, so for me, you know, I used to be an engineering manager. I, you know, I was a postdoctoral researcher. So I managed PhD students and research and all of that. So sort of leading teams and leading big projects is something I'm really familiar with. But personally, my interest is in film and television. And so for me, what was so exciting was the prospect of possibly being a producer, which basically means you're leading the project. And so Mary and I kind of talked at the end of the last year and I had this new production company. And, and so we just decided to really take a little bit more agency over our careers and start making things. And so we just were in post-production on our first short film called Every Morning and uh, starring, I co-produced it with Mary and it stars Mary and her girlfriend, Maddie, who also wrote the script. And so um, just trying to, you know, I think that's one of those things that applies to many fields is not to wait for people to call when you do realize that like you do actually have those skills and resources to just do it yourself. Yeah, and I think that takes a lot of confidence too, because uh, you know, like taking that risk and initiative to develop something and develop a project. I'm sure you must have spent a lot of your energy uh, dedicated to this as well. And where could we find this short film um, in the future when it's out? Yeah, and we'll we'll be posting it online. I mean, people can follow me on social media for updates or Space Time Productions um, for updates, specifically on the film. We'll be doing the the festival circuit kind of for the next year, and then it'll be available online. And we're just excited. You know, I think I think a big thing that, again, applies to a lot of different careers is just, you know, you mentioned the confidence, but it's really the confidence to say, I don't know, let me look it up. Or like, I, I feel like even though this isn't something I've done before, I feel smart enough. I feel like I have the resources. I have the network to learn it and learn it quickly and learn it on the job. I think that that's something that graduate school gave me that skill. And then a lot of science communication after the fact really cemented that of just being confident and saying, you know, that's interesting. Let me figure out how to do that. <laughs> and so we, we learned a lot making this film, both about ourselves, about where we wanted our careers to go um, and just the movie making process in general. And so I'm really grateful we kind of put ourselves through that to, to get to the end product. Yeah, and there's very few people in this industry who have both like the technical background, but also the ability and interest and passion to turn that into something that everybody could enjoy and everybody can take in um, and all ages. Like, I don't think there is really a limit or like being like, oh, only people 15 and above could watch this show. It's kind of like for everyone. And I think that's the beauty of communication and it has the power to really change and shape someone's life. And I'm so glad that there are people like you who are taking that initiative to share something important and something, you know, a different type of passion with everyone. I think it's so important. Thank you. And I, I think too, just kind of to your point about it, the accessibility, I think that's why science fiction in general is so important um, to give people a reference point for science that it might not be something, you know, science I think is so hard because we don't necessarily see the immediate application of why I have to learn about friction or momentum or like all these kind of weird things that we actually do see every day, but if you can point to a film and or a TV show in a moment in that that is familiar and recognizable and break down that science, suddenly the science becomes more relatable. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. I think every time I, I you know, I talk to someone, I'm like, what inspired them about space? It's always a movie or a film or a character or a book. Um, and I think that says something. And I think that's a perfect segue to my next question for you is what got you so inspired to join and, you know, pursue aerospace studies? Because you're clearly very, very passionate and educated in that industry and specifically in astrophysics. So what inspired or what was that aha moment where you were like, this is what I want to do? I think it was, um, it was obviously on the television. <laughs> the first sort of moment of the like, aha, I want to be a scientist was watching Dana Scully on the X-Files. But I quickly ruled out medical physics as a field for me because <laughs> pushy things are not, not my forte. Um, and, uh, but I actually learned in the show, Dana Scully's undergraduate was in physics, which I was like, put that nugget away for later. And then also watching Contact and watching Dr. Ellie Arroway um, do radio astronomy and do 
like actually get to see I think what's so powerful about contact was you actually got to see an astronomer be an astronomer and like what that job actually looked like now there are some nuances like you don't necessarily listen to your radio signals as they're coming <laughs> in but you know that that um you could see that job and that job for me just looked cool. And that was that aha moment of being like, I just want to do that. I want to listen to space. And I did get to have that moment when I was an undergraduate. And like I said, I did radio astronomy, again, fully motivated by Dr. Arroway from Contact. And the first time I sort of operated a radio telescope and it just went and like moved. And then I oh, saw yeah. data coming in. That was just a really sort of special moment for me. Yeah. And, you know, I just hearing that, it's funny you say that medical sciences or space wasn't something you were, you know, particularly very excited about, but that's like what my passion is. I'm extremely passionate about the intersection between space and biology and what happens to the human body in space and maybe how we could translate that into helping humans on earth. Because a lot of people, you know, I think the big thing about airspace is there's a huge misconception. And I feel like it's talked about a lot in the industry um, that, you know, like a lot of people don't realize the value of space technology in the daily lives of humans but I think it's so important to continue getting this message out to the general public and I think through shows like Star Trek it's really visible in Star Wars too I think really just putting it out there is so important and you know I'm sure this journey must have not been as easy as it may sound uh, you know a lot of times we can just look at all your accomplishments and it's like I don't know how she did all of that. She must be a genius. But I know you also must have had a few obstacles that might have kind of shaped your path to where you are today. And so I'm curious if you're comfortable, could you share a, maybe one or two obstacles you may have had in your career? And if so, you know, if you had those obstacles, how were you able to overcome them? Yeah, I no, I appreciate the question. I think, like you said, it it seems like people just kind of have a ton of accomplishments and it just happened overnight but yeah. behind that success is a lot of this sort of grind of you know my favorite quote is from Lucille Ball who said you know luck to me is hard work and knowing what's the opportunity and what's not and I really take that to heart I think the biggest struggles I've had have been those moments when I realize like I look around me and my career and my life and I'm like this isn't, this isn't what I wanted. I need to make a change. And that's happened to me a couple of times. That happened to me when I finished my PhD and I was working as a researcher. And I remember sitting down in my postdoctoral research office and just feeling like finally sort of getting over the PhD and just looking around and being like, oh no, like, I don't think I want to do this the rest of my life. I just wanted a PhD and now I'm doing this. And, um, and then just taking those, you know, really methodically, like not burning everything to the ground, but methodically taking steps to get to the next spot. And so for me, it was finding those opportunities outside of academia. What did I love about academia and what did I not love? And like, for me, a lot of what I loved was teaching. And so I started to pursue doing like adjunct professor work at community colleges, working at science museums. Um, and unfortunately that did not pay the bills. <laughs> and so my, um, so my next sort of step was working as an aerospace engineer, which for me then that was sort of that next obstacle of, I was back home in Colorado where I grew up, which was fine. But a lot of my personal life, it wasn't so much the career, but it was my personal life that I wasn't as happy in. And so taking that step of like, okay, well, what can I do to change this? And I always wanted to live in Los Angeles. I always wanted to work in television. I was like, I'm an adult. I'm going to go do that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I didn't just burn it all and go to LA. I yeah. found another aerospace job in Los Angeles, moved myself there, and then started to just kind of slowly find opportunities to work in the entertainment industry. And then when I got to a position where I felt comfortable leaving that aerospace job to just fully commit to working in entertainment, then I was poised to do that. And so um, those are kind of those big moments in life where you just are, feel like you're at a crossroads, but realizing that like every step you make kind of gives you skills that prepare you for the next one and just relentlessly not giving up in finding your happy place. <laughs> 
That's like so powerful. And I think one thing that I noticed in your response is you always just kept saying like, what can I do about it? Or like, how can I change my position? And I think a lot of times, like even as a student myself, a lot of times we're like, oh, everything is like kind of out of my control. I mean, I cannot change the situation, but I think always just remembering that, you know, you have control of what you choose to do with your life. And I think figuring out what that next step should look like but not like jumping away to like someplace that has nothing to do with what you want to do right now but something a little bit like tiny steps kind of working where you want to be I think is kind of what your journey tells us and I, I constantly notice that in your response um which is like a mindset I think a lot of us need to like just I think it's something that needs to like come within um and something that takes time and not just like be like oh it's out of my control I can't control anything but just remembering that you can control your life is so important yeah yeah, and I think too, as a student, especially, it's so important to remind yourself of that because we put so much pressure on choosing the right university, choosing the right yeah. major, that when you either either while you're doing your degree or once you're out and working in your field, you feel like, well, I went through all of that. Like I have to do it now. And you yeah. don't, like you can, there are so many skills are transferable. And so just keeping that open mind and just that self-reflection is is important not making rash decisions but but really being yeah conscious and methodical about it exactly and you know with your incredible experience in the industry with from very unique perspectives i have never actually interviewed a uh, someone who's in the intersection between scientific studies academia but also combining that with entertainment i think that's such an interesting intersection you know a lot of times i talk with people and they're like oh space engineers scientists and physicists like that's it that's all there is to it but I think just you know at the conference too I saw so many incredible individuals from such interdisciplinary backgrounds which is something I love about aerospace um, and I'm curious from your experience what makes you excited and what makes you nervous for the future of the aerospace industry yeah I feel I feel very excited about all the different initiatives and technologies that we have that are allowing us to make those next steps. I think just the technology and capability is just catching up to what our dreams are and what our hope is for the future. Um, what does scare me a little bit is the fact that we are in a we're in a space race of a different sort now, which is a capitalistic space race, you know, where corporations are are fighting to get to space. Um, but corporations have a bottom line and they're profit driven. And um, I worry that in that mix, that space will become inaccessible to the general public. And that's something I'm so passionate about is that like, you know, kids can look at astronauts on the space station and really feel like they could do that. And even to the extent that kids can call into the space station because it's a public service, you can watch NASA TV you know, for free and watch astronauts do spacewalks. And I just worry that as it gets more corporatized, that it's going to become less accessible. And so I just always have that eye to finding those opportunities to continue reminding us that like space really is the great unifier for the human race and so or the human species. And so I just think it's so important to uh, keep that ethos as we move forward in space exploration. Yeah, I think, you know, those are two really great points. I think if space is rapidly changing and growing in both positive and negative ways, I think it's important to be cautious on both sides. Um, I think the things that excite me the most are the number of like job opportunities in the future in the aerospace industry. It's starting to become such a big industry with so many different types of careers that can get involved. Um, and I think we won't even know what types of careers are going to be needed in the next 10 years. And that's what really excites me. So I think that brings in the point that you were saying the skills are so transparent transferable like you can have a degree in like I don't know communications but it could be used in literally any single field because communications is critical for anything so I think it's just so important to have that perspective but also be cautious of um yeah I see, you know I remember at the conference too there was a lot of discussion about you know what is this cooperation going to look like in the future and what does that mean to the public and I think just having those conversations but also taking action on making sure this is accessible to everyone is is really critical yeah. And so, yeah, now that we're able to understand a little bit more about your journey, as well as some of your insights, uh, my last and final question that I ask every um, person that I interview is what final piece of advice do you have for every student pursuing a career in STEM, aerospace, really just any career, something you wish some, you know, someone told you when you were in middle school or high school? 
Yeah, um, is I think, you know, we've alluded to it here and there, but I think it really is just to keep pursuing your dreams, um, to really not give up or get dissuaded because everything you learn and every step you take is going to apply to the next one. And so never feel stuck, never feel like helpless. There, there's always little things that you can do and people you can reach out to, especially these days, um, who can help you make those next steps. So just continue to be reflective, continue to follow that passion, what got in, you into it in the first place. And if that's no longer your passion, that's fine. Find the next thing, you know, and, and just keep pushing because you'll get there. Yeah, I think that's wonderful advice. I think you should keep chasing your dream. Um, I think, you know, if you have a goal in mind and you keep working towards that, you're going to be both happy and you're going to be like, you're going to find that long-term success that you're looking for. And also what you were saying about community and just reaching out. Uh, you know, I have to definitely echo that. I've interviewed so many incredible individuals like yourself. And I just reached out to you on Twitter and I remember you saw the message and you like immediately responded to me. And I was really, really excited because I didn't think that, so many people like you would be so open and like, ex you know, receptive to doing opportunities like these and to just talk and share your advice and your journey with others. And just knowing that there's people, I think aerospace is one of those industries that's just so open and accepting. I'm not sure how every other industry is, but I can <laughs> definitely say aerospace is. And just knowing that you can just reach out for mentors and, you know, ask your questions because I'm sure there's someone with an answer for you is just really critical. So thank you so much for sharing your advice. I know I will keep it in heart as I grow older and I want to thank you so much for your time um, I was inspired and I'm sure every single person who's listening is inspired so thank you so much for your time yeah thank you I appreciate it